Disruptors and curious minds. It's 1030 Eastern. It's Thursday. It's time to party. Welcome to Thinking on Paper. <laughs> My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. This is Mark Fielding. Hello. We fortunately get to talk to the builders and the futurists and the people designing the new future of the world, where we're headed, systems, technologies, philosophies, all of that fun stuff. We get to kind of explore that. Uh, we try to stay rooted in today because it's important to bridge yesterday to tomorrow. And uh, hopefully we can have some fun doing that. Mark is still on holiday. My kids have started school today. So my internet connection is actually doing very well. We don't have <laughs> nine kids playing uh, Fortnite. So I'm in good shape. Mark, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm excited. It's quantum season, Jeremy. We've yeah. been we've yeah. been building up to this for a long time. Um, we've had lots of kind of dips into quantum computing. We've explored quantum mechanics in our own special way with Book Club. And today we're speaking to... Somebody is actually, well, we're going to find that building quantum algorithm, a building, writing, composing, compiling quantum algorithm. So I'm very excited and I hope the internet connection will uh, do me justice. That's what you get for living in cool spaces, man. Well, hey, a uh, quick shout out. Uh, this, this episode is brought to you by the original technology writing via the program, right to know you, www.writetoknowyou.com, writing to understand yourself and the world around you. So um, quantum is really interesting, right? Just quantum physics in general, because it's super counter to how we perceive reality. Just just quantum mechanics, not even quantum, quantum computing, right? So no matter what quantum is in computing or physics, we as humans really struggle to figure out if we're not into it, if we're not building in it, if we're not developing that technology it's counter to our reality so like i think balancing that has got to be the key to scaling these technologies right well it's the ultimate multitasking isn't it the double tasking we can't get our heads around this juxtaposition of being in two places at the same time even if you're potentially light years apart um yeah it's it's i've always thought about quantum computing as kind of the puppet master. We, we speak a lot about AI and blockchain on this show, but I think in the future, like, like 20, 30, 50, 100, however many years ahead it is, there'll be quantum at the top, pulling the strings and helping all these other technologies to drive humanity forward. And I, I think that that's how I always see it. So, yeah. Well, off we go. As always, we'll dig into the tech. We'll understand the philosophies behind the tech. And we may even have some fun thought experiments today planned. So, Mark, without further ado, let's. Uh, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah. So our guest today is Joe Fitzsimon. He's the CEO and founder of Horizon Quantum. I first met Joe when I was moderating a panel on quantum at Vivitech in Paris. And it was so enlightening. I thought we have to have the second part. So here we are. Joe, welcome to Thinking on Paper. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure um, is all ours and our audiences. Um, so as we like to thread our shows together, um, we like to leave our last guest to leave a question for our next guest, which sometimes is related to what we're going to talk about. Sometimes it isn't. Our last guest was pretty awesome. Um, she was talking about mental health in gaming communities. And her question for you, Joe, was, do you have some... <laughs> some some wisdom for the next generation <laughs> quite open question that's a big question <laughs> that's a big question yeah that's a that's a tough one um yeah so i mean with these type of questions i think you know i've been around a while now i'm i'm not young anymore um so i think the one thing that i've realized over time is that um there's more than one pathway to happiness, more than one pathway to success. And that many times um, I spent a lot of my life as a professor uh, in universities um, and you see students come in uh, and they think that they have to go a particular path. They have to do this while on the exams, they have to get into this grad school, they have to go this path. And after that, they need to get a postdoc here and go down a particular path if they want to be a physicist, if they want to you know, they have their life planned out. And I think one of the things you realize as you get older is that there is not one path to happiness. So if you miss a turn along the way on that path, you don't need to have that planned out. There are many ways of getting to a place that you're happy with to 
success in some form or another that isn't necessarily all planned out. It's, nothing ever works out exactly as you planned. I, I think that's what I would say. Nice. Good advice. I like that a lot. I think that society in general tends to try to point us to early convergence on something, right? And and you get down into that linear mindset when, you know, you, you, it's it's okay to kind of kind of keep things open and, and have these choose your own adventures where you can jump into different pools, learn some things, jump into other pools. And I think that's great. And I would totally echo that. Um, Joe, let's, let's start from the top. Let's talk about from like, what are some important aspects or principles of quantum either quantum physics or quantum computing that people uh, it would help be helpful for them to understand like the basic stuff, right? Not someone who's going to program quantum, not someone who is testing superposition with photons, but like for just the general public, what are some important principles to understand of quantum? Okay. So, you know, it's kind of hard to condense quantum mechanics into five minutes or, or less or 30 seconds, whatever it is. Um, what I would say that the main thing to understand about quantum uh, information, quantum mechanics, is that it's not as strange as it's made out to be in popular culture. So it's also worth understanding that it is actually how the universe works at its lowest level. If you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in underneath everything, you find quantum mechanics. And the main basis of quantum mechanics, what's really happening is what gives rise to probabilities in, in, our, in our experience. So if you have, for example, like if it hits a piece of glass, there is some chance that it passes through the glass and there's some chance that it's reflected off the glass. Um, and we would characterize those by probabilities, right? We'd say maybe there's a 50% chance it passes through, 50% chance it bounces off. But actually, if you want the most detailed description at the lowest level of what is going on, these things are not actually described by probabilities. Instead, they're described by what we call amplitudes, which turns out mathematically they're the square roots of probabilities. Uh, but these numbers can be either positive or negative. And you would think, well, maybe this doesn't make much of a difference. I can just think about probabilities. But the reason you need to care about amplitudes is because if this photon has several different ways of getting to a particular point, maybe it bounces off glass in one particular uh, path, but there's also another path with different bounces passing through different pieces of glass that reaches that other point. If they come there and one has positive amplitude and the other way has negative amplitude, they can cancel out. And you, you actually see this with, you see it with sound waves, you see it with waves on water, where you have a peak and a trough come together and they cancel out. And the net result of this is that the chance of the light, the particle of light, the photon hitting that point, isn't given by the probability of it going one way plus the probability of it going another way. Instead, it's zero because the positive part is canceling the, the negative part. So you can have these interference effects and that's what quantum mechanics is. The only difference from classical physics, from the physics of the 19th century, is these interference effects between particles uh, that, as we now understand it, underlie everything we see, er everything we experience, how all matter interacts within the universe. Okay. And we're coming, we're coming fresh off reading uh, Carlo Rovelli's book in our book club, uh, The Order of Time, which has a lot to do with, well, entropy, but like quantum mechanics and, and how our brains, this is really interesting, Joe, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Like, were our, were our brains designed uh, the way that they are limited in our ability to see things at the subatomic particle level? Was that by design so we didn't overload ourselves and freak out and like, is it is it a is it a positive governor on our brain or like what what do you think about that? Um, so I'm not a very um, religious or spiritual person. I'm not you know um, drawn to supernatural explanations for for anything. If I you know if you think about the uh, of a photon passing through a piece of glass going one way or the other way. Now, I've said the weird quantum effects are from interference, when the photon can get to, to some place in multiple different ways. But if we were to measure it along its path, 
so that it would either hit the detector and we'd, we'd measure the photon in one place or we'd measure it somewhere else, then we will never see that interference effect. And that's what's happening in the world around us when we don't have well-isolated systems. So if you don't have a single photon that's well-isolated from the rest of the universe, but instead you've got atoms that are interacting with other atoms, bouncing off each other, photons bouncing off them and flying off at the speed of light into space. When you have that, it kind of suppresses those quantum effects. So they, you see probabilities come out from it. So it looks like things are happening with some chance rather than with these quantum amplitudes. And if you think of us as the kind of measurement device, so instead of having a some kind of detector that's going to measure your single photon, instead, you know, you're there with your eye and the light goes into your eye and you see a little, uh, a little spark, then, you know, you've detected it. You've seen that it was one path versus another. You don't have a way of seeing it in two different places. Now, can you see interference effects? Yeah, absolutely. If you take a hair, pluck it off your head, and if you have a laser pointer, and you put the hair in front of the laser pointer so that it's cutting across the beam, and you shine that, you'll find that you get different bands of light and dark. And that's what's happening. In the 19th century, they explained this by saying light was a wave, and you have these waves uh, interfering with one another. But we know that it has a particle nature too. You can measure it as single photons. And every single one of those photons exhibits this wave-like behavior. And this from the, that quantum effect, that interference between the different possible paths that could happen. But we only see the net result. We don't experience it in two places at the one time. We only see it once come back together to a single point. So we've seen the result of the interference, but we don't get to experience the interference itself. Is, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that ever going to change a, a will we ever be able to see that the other paths or it, do we need to ever see those other paths or are those other paths the the multiverse is that are they happening in other worlds or other realities like what's the the consensus on that um <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is uh, this is a way to start a religious war between physicists. Um, so uh, there's uh, there are these th there's this area that the interpretations of quantum mechanics, and there is basically not a way to prove which interpretation is correct. Whether we go when we see when we measure one in one path or another, whether that means that we have collapsed it and, and it's become a probability or whether we are now in that superposition as well. There's like one copy of me that saw it one way and another copy of me that the other eye saw it or something like that. Um, and that second one is, is sometimes called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics um, or the, the Everett interpretation. Um, the other one where you're, where you're, where you see it being turned into a probability or not you see it, sorry, I've used sight to mean measuring the photon, but where it's turned into a probability because we have somehow measured it and we're special, uh, that's called the Copenhagen interpretation. So, you know, the maths works out the same no matter what you're trying to do. You can't come up with an experiment to distinguish these other than trying to put, you know, get quantum interference with a, a person or something like that uh, and try to see these interference effects, but that's basically impossible. So, in practice, no, we can't see, we can't experience both paths at the same time. But what we can see is the result of interference between different possible paths. So we call these branches, different branches of a superposition. So when a thing can happen in one way or another, so the photon can hit the glass and pass through, or the photon can hit it and bounce off, we say in one branch it passes through and then the other branch it, uh, it bounces off. Mathematically, we just write these as a summation. They don't really exist. I mean, we only see the the collective result. We don't see what happens for each individual path, and there's no well, way the, to extract that. Well, the well the good the good news for humanity at large is we're results oriented, and we like to see things quickly. So maybe us not having patience for all of that not us, but like humans not having yeah. patience uh, and wanting the result could be to our benefit. Um, Super interesting. So I want to I want to touch on one thing as we transition from like quantum physics, quantum mechanics into quantum computing. So um, the idea of like 
it, so is the ma magic of quantum or the, the, the just, and let's use that as a large term, um, due to its isolation. So we talked about trapped ion. We, we haven't talked about trapped ions, but like trapped ions is like kind of a way quantum computers work. Is it, is it in the isolation that we're able to harness the magic? Is that how it works? Um, it, it's for precisely the reason I was saying earlier that when you have a complicated system with many degrees of freedom, many different particles in it, and they're all interacting with each other, and it's an open system, so things are interacting with them, and then you know a photon particle of light bounces off one of those ions and shoots off at the speed of light, and you can never catch that, right? You can't run faster than the speed of light. You can just never get that photon back to see interference effects with it. So when that happens, we see this transition from these quantum amplitudes to classical probabilities. And that looks like the classical world. It, when I use classical, I mean just the world as we experience it, the world of kind of the way 19th century physics understood it. Um, but to see these quantum effects, we tend to need to isolate the systems very well so that we don't lose information about which path the photon or the particle took or which of different states it was in. If that information is emitted into the environment, then we won't see interference effects between the different branches. So you really need to contain all of the information about which path or which possible uh, branch was uh, you know, a particle explored. You need to keep that localized. You need to keep that contained in a small region of space so that your interference effect, because you need to bring all of that information together at a single point in space. Uh, when you try to do it, it, you know, with an open system where you have light coming in, bouncing off it, where you have, uh, you know, maybe heat and all sorts of different things, electric charge moving around, things like this that can affect the outside world. That's leaking information all the time about which, you know, which position the particle's in, which state the particle's in. And that record of which state it was in prevents interference because actually the knowledge about which path was taken is already, you know, it's stored in the universe somewhere. So you can't see the result of each of the paths because we already know which path it was. Well, we may not know, but the information is stored somewhere in the universe. It's captured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, exactly. I, love that. I love that idea of something being stored somewhere in the universe. I think it's such a wonderful phrase. Okay, so everything you've just said is how much of it do you need to work in quantum computing. So I, you're as a CEO of Horizon, I, I read on your website, there's a thousand quantum computer specialists in the world. Okay, that's basically, it might as well be zero. And how much of what you just said do people need to know and understand to become a quantum computer specialist? So what I'd say is, well, there are more than a thousand people that, no quantum mechanics. There, there's definitely more than a thousand people that work on quantum mechanics in some form or another. So I think the number on our website is more the number of people that have worked on quantum algorithms or have some experience right. in that area. If you look at quantum computing as a field, there are people that work on hardware, people that work on error correction and on other areas. So the field's bigger than a thousand people, but the number of people that actively work on quantum algorithms is actually a lot less than a thousand, I would say. It's you know, a couple of hundred at most. Hmm. Um, but in terms of what experience you need to work in quantum computing, in the industry at least, um, you don't necessarily need any experience of quantum mechanics. So if you look at quantum computing companies or companies that are engaged in quantum computing, of course, you need some people that understand quantum mechanics very well and understand quantum computing. And often these are coming from research careers. So they're coming with PhDs or something in the area or a lot of experience working on this domain or an adjacent field. Um, but you also need people coming from conventional computer science, software engineers. You need product managers, you need UI UX designers, all the different parts that you would need to build any tech company. Um, you just also need some people that know a lot about quantum mechanics. So let's let's talk about, so when a lot of people talk about quantum computing, they're always focused on the quantum computer, the computer itself, the hardware, how it works, 
you know, what it's made out of, you know, cryptography is like a big thing that always comes up, but like, let's talk about the software, right? Cause I think that's what you're, you're focused on in software, like creates the, the ability to use that hardware in a, in a, in a novel way. Right. So what are you doing in the realm of software to, to, you know, kind of make that easier for people? Could I just I'd, I'd ask you a question on that, Jeremy, before Joe answers that? How consciously aware were you of quantum software before we started looking at quantum computers and quantum mechanics with thinking on paper? Because for me, like you said, when I thought of quantum computing, I thought of the hardware. I thought of these incredibly beautiful machines that you see on the cover of Time magazine. And I didn't really think of it as software how important and necessary the software aspect was the one aspect that i knew but and before joe you get into the, the, the question the one aspect that i understood was that uh the software the languages required to program a quantum computer are different than the ones for traditional computing so like that's the biggest problem there are all these apps and structures and software platforms and programs that we have in languages that, um, that do great with traditional computing, but it's not like we can just grab those and throw them at a quantum computer, right? So that that was my basis for understanding. Okay. So, uh, I mean, from my perspective, there's basically two main barriers to getting to useful quantum computing. And by useful quantum computing, I mean having a quantum computer that actually you, you use to solve something that's actually meaningfully interesting. You know, if you're, I mean, you use it to solve a meaningful problem that you couldn't have solved in another way or you couldn't easily have solved in another way. Um, so the first barrier is that you need the quantum processor. You need a machine, you need a device that can process information in accordance with the rules of quantum mechanics. And that means isolating it extremely well from the environment. And when I talked about paths before, I talked about you know, a photon going one way or another way. That's not really what we're necessarily thinking about in a quantum computer. Instead, we're just thinking about bit strings, representations of information, zeros and ones. And we're saying, well, maybe it goes through this pattern of zeros and ones, or maybe it goes through this other pattern of zeros and ones as an intermediate state before you get to the endpoint of the computation. So you need to build the hardware that's able to do that, that's able to go through these superpositions of different classical states. And when I say classical, I just mean conventional, what you would have on a regular computer. Um, but then you need to actually figure out how do I use this, super, this superposition of states? How do I use this interference between the different possible paths, the different possible branches my computation can go down? How do I use that to actually solve a problem? Um, and it turns out that's not at all obvious we don't really have an intuition for this, right? We grow up in a world where it is at its heart classical, where it obeys the laws of 19th century physics. And unless we start looking into the details of how single particles of light work or how transistors work or something like this, we're not gonna see any quantum mechanics. Our day-to-day -day experience doesn't have a, even, okay, we see some wave effects, but not very often. I mean, you might experience it at a concert when the speakers are set up, some places are quieter than others. You might experience it splashing around in the pool on holidays or something like this, but it's just not something you interact that strongly with, right? It's just not a big part of your life. But when you think about how you accomplish a task, particularly an information processing task, so like solving a mathematical problem, the way we solve it is usually with pen and paper, or at least until you end up using a calculator or a computer. But if you think about how you do it in school, it's a pen and paper, you like record little, you record numbers to the page, you read part of it into your brain, make a simple manipulation, you know, add some numbers, write the result down and you keep crunching through it that way. And that's the way a conventional computer is essentially working. You've got the computer's memory and you've got the processor. You can think of the processor as your head. So it's reading in some information from the memory. It's making a simple manipulation, recording the result, and just repeating that process over and over again, according to some rule. And it uses that to solve the problem. Um, and we can reason about how the computer should work. We can program the computer based on how we would solve it ourselves with pen and paper. Okay, maybe it's not exactly.
be the same. Maybe the computer is recording the information using some data structures that are like an efficient way to store the information, but not what you would do yourself on pen and paper. It's much faster than you at making simple, uh, simple calculations. You know, there's different things that are slight differences, but broadly speaking, how we go about solving problems with pen and paper and how we go about solving them on a laptop or, you know, using even a supercomputer today, they're similar. So your intuition carries over very well. When you get to quantum computing, you don't have that intuition. You just don't have experience of the quantum world. And I mean, none of us do. If you work on it for a very long time, maybe you build up some minor intuition, but you don't have firsthand experience, right? It's not like, it's not like conventional computing. It's not like the experience, the intuition we've built up over decades and decades of living in the world we live in. Having that experience, the like, well, lacking that experience of the quant of the quantum world, of the rules of quantum mechanics, of the world behaving in that way, it kind of means we're ill-equipped for being able to construct quantum algorithms. And th this has been a, a notoriously hard problem. So the, the first quantum algorithms, the first really interesting ones, I would say, were discovered in the early 90s, around 93, 94. Um, these included uh, an algorithm for factoring large numbers, which um, is really important in relation to modern cryptography. Um, it also included an algorithm for search. So if you have some uh, disordered database, so let's say you have a telephone directory and I give you a telephone number and ask you to find the name corresponding to it. If I gave you the name, it would be easy, you know, it's alphabetical order, but if I give you the number, it's really tricky. You need to look through every page. And it turns out you can do better with quantum mechanics than you can conventionally. But these were these were major achievements, and it has taken a long time before we've started to really uncover new techniques to go beyond these ones that were discovered, you know, in the 90s, uh, I would say. So being able to build up quantum algorithms from scratch is really, really challenging. We're just not equipped for it. So what we're focused on at Horizon is trying to make that transition easier trying to get to a point where we can automatically construct those quantum algorithms. But really, without quantum software, without the software to take advantage of the quantum computer, it's it's like, I mean, it's even less useful than a conventional, uh, like than a laptop or something where everything has been erased and you have no way of loading anything else onto it. It's just some, I mean, it's, the, it's some silicon and some, you know, lithium ion batteries and stuff, but it doesn't do anything. It it needs the instructions. It needs the software to function. Um, I love the idea of an algorithm being discovered, which gives lots of, it implies that it existed before um, rather than being created. Um, so I think, Jamie, this leads on to the compiler, does it not? Your question on what is, like, how do you achieve this? How do you, how do you create that? Sure. Yeah. So, I, I mean, actually, let me talk first a little bit about the uh, your comment there about uh, being an algorithm being discovered rather than created. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing, and I think many people that work in science feel that they discover things rather than create them, that it was there to be discovered. Um, but another way of seeing this with things like algorithms and so on is that actually you can start enumerating quantum programs. You can say, what is the simplest quantum program I could possibly have? And then what's the next simplest and so on. So you can put an order on them from simplest to hardest, but or most complicated, but the most complicated one is infinitely complicated. So there's no last one. There's an infinite number of these, but there is definitely a first one. So you can start at the first one and you could start enumerating them. You could try one after the next, after the next, after the next, until you found it. You know, it is there to be discovered, although it would be incredibly, I mean, you couldn't really do it in this way. There's too many possibilities, but it is there. It, it's hiding in the mathematics. It's hiding in the laws of the universe somewhere. I, I so I think that's why, <laughs> yeah. so I think that's why we feel it's like discovery rather than, uh, rather than invention in some sense. 
Um, in terms of what we do in terms of our compiler and so on, basically what we've tried to start doing is to automate the way someone like me or someone else working in quantum computing might approach constructing an algorithm. Um, often you don't do it from scratch. Um, the, you know, if you are hired, suppose you're a professor working in quantum computing, something like that, you work a lot on quantum algorithms and a company approaches you and they say, you know, could you give us some consulting time? We really want to see if we can figure out a quantum algorithm to solve this problem that's really important to us. Your first question should be, how do you currently solve it? If you don't ask that question, you run the risk of looking very foolish by coming up with an elaborate algorithm that is much worse than what they currently have. So you, you should start there, right? How do you currently do it? And I think that's po also... probably a question for many, many, many realms beyond just quantum computing, but yeah. Universally applicable, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so like, you know, start there, ask how do you currently do it? Because also, if you know how they currently do it and, you know, how that performs, any improvement you can make to that is an improvement on their current process. So you don't necessarily need to get to the theoretical best algorithm that would ever be possible. You need to do better than they can currently do. And, you know, whether that's a big enough improvement for them to be meaningful or not is a different question. But that's what you're looking to do. You're looking to improve on the current state of the art. So the way we approach this um, is that what we do is we take code that's written for a conventional computer. We then try to look at the things that make it slow. So if you think about how computer code works, there's a couple of different things that lead to its complexity, that lead to how long it's going to take to execute. And they're very rarely the number of lines of code. So it's usually not the amount of code. Rather, it's the structures within the code. And those are things like loops, where the same piece of code is getting called again and again and again and again. Or there are maybe recursive function calls, where a function calls itself. So that piece of code is getting called again and again and again and again. Or it calls another thing that calls back the first one or something like that. So the whole thing telescopes out, and you have the same bits of code called again and again and again and again. Um, so what we need to do is we need to start trying to get rid of these. So that means when we have a loop in the program, for example, we need to start breaking it down into simpler parts. So if you have a loop, there might be many instructions inside it, many other structures within it. And we, what we want to do basically is break these down into many loops, but much simpler loops. And then what we want to do is recognize what each loop is doing. Once we've broken it down to its most simple form, we want to say, what does this do? And do we have another way of doing that that's more efficient? And if you were given just a general loop and say, is there a more efficient way of doing this? That's a really challenging problem. But if you've already broken it down to this really simple form where you have maybe a loop and you have just one thing inside it, then there's only so many possibilities. And you can start to enumerate them. You can start to write down rules for every possibility that could possibly arise. And in some of these cases, you can replace it with a more efficient quantum way of doing the same thing. So you can exploit that quantum search algorithm, for example, in certain scenarios to accelerate how you traverse uh, the loop and so on. So you can, I, start, can I ask one, one yeah. question related to the loop? Sure. Just, to, just to, as, I'm, as I'm thinking through this. So you have a loop that in the code that kind of you know spins around and does something to collect or to, to have a specific output that helps move it down the process a little bit. But from a quantum level, that output, that could be a different output every time. That, there could be variability in the path that that loop takes, right? So is that where you can kind of separate that out and then turn that into like a quantum parallel path thing? Is that kind of where we're headed with this? So um, it's not quite like that. So what I'd say is, you know, a, a very uh, kind of common occurrence is that you might have a loop and in that loop, there's an if statement and only if the condition on the loop is true, sorry, only if the condition on the if is true, will something happen? 
So a lot of the times you pass through the loop, nothing happens, but only sometimes something happens. So what you can say is, can I try to find the times at which something happens without having, without having to evaluate that condition in sequence? That Every time. Happens? Yeah. yeah. And okay. it turns out you can, it turns out there's quantum methods of doing this. So there's, you can construct quantum algorithms that will search through that for you faster than any, any classical, any conventional algorithm could. So that allows you to get a quantum sp speed up there. The other way you can get speed ups in these things, aside from manipulating loops and recursive function calls and trying to find quantum algorithms for implementing them better, is to look at the other thing that's happening. So within these loops, within your code, you have all of these operations happening where you're manipulating different types of data. So, you know, I have I have two numbers I'm going to add together and store as a third number and so on. And adding numbers is pretty simple. There's not much to be accelerated there. But you get to more complex operations, like I'm multiplying two big matrices together. And there you can start to use quantum algorithms to accelerate that process. So you can also think about how is information stored and manipulated. You don't have to store it and manipulate it in the same way as on a conventional computer. You can try to come up with better quantum ways of representing the data and manipulating the data. But if you take that, just operating on data, doing doing fixed operate, uh, fixed operations to data, and traversing control flow, uh, if you put those two ingredients together, you have everything. You have all of computing. Well, with the exception of like input and output, where you're interacting with another system. But that's that's everything. Anything you want to compute, you can compute in this way. So if you understand how to accelerate both parts, then you can accelerate general computation. So a lot of this, a lot of this is pointing in the direction of like efficiency, faster, better, kind of than what than than what we're doing today. So let's 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 pause uh, on that for a second and take let's jump on the thought experiment train a little bit, right? So let's imagine, however many years into the future, quantum mechan or quantum computing has largely been adopted in governments, in major enterprises, in every amount of innovation. Think of what traditional computing we're doing today that has finally made this big shift into quantum. What does the world look like? What do transportation systems look like? What does government look like? What is, yeah, just let's riff on that for a second. The same, but more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that's, I don't think that's true. So um, I think the improvements in processing efficiency you can get from quantum mechanics are so large that they are not, an increment they don't lead to incremental change they lead to very large scale change so if, if you think about the computing revolution like everything your computer does could have been done by hand every calculation it does it, you know it's just adding numbers and multiplying numbers that's all it's doing but but not really right there's there's something the fact that my computer can do this but not do it you know every couple of seconds rather it can multiply these numbers you know in a fraction of a nanosecond and it can be multiplying many of them in parallel um that has a very very real consequence i can definitely do things that i could never have done on paper you know not in a million years the the change is just so drastic that it enables entirely new things even if they are composed of tasks that could have been done in other ways. So if you think about um, if you think about quantum computing, I think one of the things that's important to understand about quantum computing is how difficult it is to simulate with conventional computers. So if you have a perfect quantum computer that has no noise, no errors at all, every time you add a qubit to that quantum computer, it becomes twice as hard to simulate on a conventional computer. For every one qubit. For every one qubit. Now, you could say, well, what rate are we adding qubits to the device? But we're not adding the qubits one at a time. Instead, we're doubling the size of the devices regularly. And if you look at what's happened with quantum computers that exist today, they're still limited, they still have errors, there's, you know, there's definitely real restrictions. They're not yet fully useful. 
But if you look at the rate of change, there is a kind of quantum Moore's law. And for a long time, the number of qubits in a device was doubling pretty regularly once every five years. And that happened from the very first quantum computers in the 90s up to you know, 2016, 2017, 2018. But since then, as industry has started to play a, a part, those systems, those kind of the largest systems up to then were mostly, were almost entirely in academia or government labs. What has happened since then is that there has been an emergence of a quantum computing industry where there are startups as well as established tech companies that have built up big programs in the area that are trying to build better and better processors. And since then, that doubling time of once every five years, which is more than three times slower than Moore's law, has come right down to doubling once every eight or nine months, which is twice as fast as Moore's law. So we have these systems that are doubling every eight to nine months, doubling definitely less than uh, on a time scale of less than uh, less than a year. But for every qubit they add, the uh, the difficulty of simulating it with a conventional computer and the computational power of that system grows exponentially. It's doubling every time. Could you just give us an idea of what a conventional computer is in that comparison? Because it's not my computer. Well, I mean, you can simulate a quantum computer on your computer, but the size of the quantum computer you can simulate on your computer is smaller than the size of the quantum computer you can simulate on a large supercomputer. So you can probably simulate, you know, 28, 30 qubits on your computer. Okay. You know, you can probably simulate 40 something on a large supercomputer. Uh, but once you say 50, 60, 70, it's impossible. 70, 70 perfect qubits for a, a deep computation, a, a long computation, you've no chance of doing that. Like that requires so much memory. It, it's just not something you can conceivably do. And the largest quantum computers today are not at 70 qubits, they're at 1100 qubits. And that is very far beyond it. Now, there's still errors that occur in these, and those errors make it easier to simulate. But if you were able to squeeze out those errors and you had 1100 qubits, there is no conventional computer on earth that could come close to simulating that system. Now, does it mean it's useful yet? Not necessarily because you need to be able to take a problem of interest and fit it into a device that small. You know, with that 1100 qubits is still quite limited because if we think of a computer with 1100 bits, um, there is a computer with about 1100 bits and that's an Atari 2600. Um, and that's if you think where about, we are. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, that's except, that's that's pretty that's pretty crazy to 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 think about. That sorry to cut you off, Joe. One yeah. one quick thought I had, and you mentioned this earlier, is um, our ability to our intuition is limited in the quantum world, which leads to us um, having difficulty imagining what can be done with it. Kind of and 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 do this does does simulating quantum work on conventional computers is that the process we have to go through to figure out the usefulness of them just because we can't just because our intuition isn't there to do it talk to me about the simulation piece of this no yeah. not not at all actually um I, I think it's quite um it's quite common with beginners that they like to use simulators to be able to uh get very quick feedback to try different things and see how they work but actually, the way we understand these algorithms, the way we prove they work and so on, tends to be more pen and paper mathematics. Um, so we tend to write down a general description of what it's doing uh, and from that, you know, figure out how many operations it would require and so on. And understanding how to take advantage of quantum mechanics, uh, a lot of the time you care about doing uh, transformations of the data. We, we call these quantum Fourier transforms. Uh, but you're you're taking a Fourier transform of your data again and again uh, and trying to use that in a constructive way. And that's, um, you know, that's a challenge, but it's something that we understand the mathematics of pretty well. Now, how to do useful things, that's more challenging. But writing down the net effect as a mathematical object, yeah, we can do that fairly well. Um, but the, the place I was going with this is basically to say 
that combination of the of the quantum computers growing exponentially in size with the exponential difficulty of simulating them means that the power of quantum computers or the power of quantum computers even compared to the conventional computing as it's growing exponentially with time it's double exponential and this is not something we're used to there's very 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 few things in the world that grow at a double exponential rate but if you look at quantum algorithms for machine learning for example you know i i used to work on some of these before i started horizon and one that we had worked on was for a particular machine learning model called gaussian process regression but if you wanted to train a model with a thousand uh with a thousand training points uh and then you well, you want to get a prediction out of that that has some cost on a conventional computer it's going to take some number of operations but if you were then to increase to a million data points the slowdown would be about a factor of about a billion wow on a quantum computer the slowdown is a factor of four <laughs> and if you were to go from a million training points to a trillion training points the slowdown would be another factor of four so the so when we think about what quantum computers can do, it's very hard for us to comprehend in terms of some of these things, the speed up, the change with time is so enormous that it's really hard to comprehend. And that's why I say it's like that change from not having computers to having computers, from mm -hmm. when computers were people to when computers were machines. Uh, and I think it's going to be that scale of change. Now, if you ask others, they will give you different answers. So I'm not going to pretend that my view is shared by everyone else in the field. For sure it's not. Some people view them as just you know devices that might be useful for solving optimization problems and things like this, but just some kind of special purpose thing. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't be in this. I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't optimistic about it. At least from where I stand, the evidence seems to support it at the moment that we are on this path that can potentially lead to another computing revolution, like a second revolution in computing that is at least as big as the first. What well, your view and Horizon's view, so very often people ask, which industry will be greatly the most greatly impacted by quantum computers? Will it be pharmaceuticals? Will it be finance? Will it be biotech? And in fact, that question is obsolete because it will be all of them. <laughs> to yeah. a oh, less or greater time. degree. Yeah, over time. Yeah, so I think, I, I mean, realistically, the, the situation we're in is that quantum computing is not useful today. The systems are too noisy. Yeah. The algorithms aren't there yet, but they're getting better. All of these things are getting better, and they're getting better really quite fast at this point. But you say, well, what are the, what are the use cases? What are they going to be? Uh, and people say, well, pharma, well, you know, logistics, optimization, uh, Monte Carlo methods in banking and finance and so on. And yes, those are true. Those are applications that quantum computing can be applied to. And there's machine learning applications as well and so on. But you need to think about the time scale. So when you go from not useful to very useful, there are all sorts of in-between points on that scale. Mm -hmm. So there is a point at which it is useful for exactly one thing. I mean, that's that's likely to be the case that we will discover a first application where it first shows advantage and we will have a narrow advantage for that application. And then that will broaden a little bit and we'll see, hey, we can also solve some other related problems. And then as the systems become more capable, as the algorithms become more capable, as the software becomes more capable, we'll realize that, hey, actually, we're finding quantum speed ups, not just around these small applications, but we're finding them in many different pools. So we might have quantum advantage in different industries around different kinds of problems in that. And then over time, we'll see it just take more and more and more of the problem space. So you start to see it absorb more and more and more of what conventional computers can do, at least for kind of computationally limited tasks. Now, quantum computers are not better than conventional computers for every possible problem. So if, if I give you a huge list of numbers and I ask you to tell me, is the, you know, is the result of adding them up odd or even, quantum computers aren't any better at that problem than conventional computers. It, it turns out that it's a really, really, really easy problem. 
Um, and for these really easy problems, you know, the quantum computing doesn't help you because the classical solution is already so efficient. But we're discovering more and more regimes of hard problems where there really is an advantage to being able to use a quantum computer. At first, it may not, it, it may not be worth it. So, you know, in the earliest days of quantum computing, as we start getting, you know, examples of them being useful for one problem or another, we will know of other problems. We currently do know of many problems where they would be useful, but where maybe the overhead is too high. So if I do something on a silicon computer, on a silicon chip in my in my laptop, I can do it at four gigahertz or whatever the clock speed is. Uh, so the rate at which I can do individual instructions is extremely high. But if I want to do that in an ion track quantum computer, then I'm talking about, you know, a microsecond or hundreds of nanoseconds to do operations, individual operations. So there's this big slowdown, you know, slowdown of a factor of 100 or something or more, or 400, uh, over what I could do on my silicon computer. And that doesn't begin to take into account the overhead that I'd need for error correction as well to correct the errors that the quantum computer is experiencing. So there's this price to pay up front that you have to overcome. So for problems that are really easy, it makes no sense to do that. You just stick with silicon, it's fast, it's cheap. Um, but for really hard problems, it makes a lot of sense to pay that price up front. Because once you overcome that fixed price, everything else becomes much faster. And that and that one solution gets applied over scale and then you then you hit this this is all this is all fascinating, Joe. I, I could I could I could dive into this for, for quite a long time. Definitely want to be mindful of time related. Time was a theme actually that you talked about throughout all of that. Just the the time to be able to do things, how fast something can operate, the, the exponential scale, the, the two X exponential. I mean, these are, these are, these are big things to think about. The one thing that stood with me and I think will carry over for me is that, that what you said was about quantum, you know, being similar to like what happened when we didn't have computers traditionally and we had computers traditionally that's an interesting thing to think about and i think for our audience to consider and think about um one in wrapping what is one question you would like to leave for our our next guest and mark is our next guest the 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 um the robot pill people no i, I think that um joe might know our next guest it's uh jason lynch um, oh, equal, right. e equal one which Okay. Um, so quantum, you, yeah. you you may or may not know him. Yeah, we have an office in Ireland, and I'm Irish, so I'm uh, yeah, definitely uh, equal one or there as well. Um, yeah, okay, that's uh, yeah, I, I should have planned this ahead of time. Um, I guess if it's going to be quantum that you're talking about, yeah. then one question might be what are the applications we haven't thought of? What are going to be the surprising outcomes that no one is saying at this point? So everyone says so optimization, drug discovery, uh, finance, different things like this. But what's going to be our um, equivalent of YouTube, of watching cat videos on YouTube, right? You know, the killer application for laptops, for mobile phones, things like this. Part of it is watching cat videos, right? And if you talked about, uh, if you talked about this, you know, in the 1930s, 1940s, when people were building the very first computers, you would have said it totally. So what's going to be the killer application of computing as they mature? Great question. Quantum cat videos. Could I, sorry, could I, I just had one question that I want to ask for a friend actually and i know that on horizon's website you talk about um what if you could program a quantum computer like you could a classical computer and i have a friend he, he he's a programmer but it, it, is there a particular language which would be better suited to make the crossover and if there is or if there isn't what would my friend have to do to get into the blue ocean of quantum programming if you wanted to leave it behind yeah so um good question um, to be honest, at the moment, uh, many people come into quantum computing programming in Python. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of quantum related packages in Python. 
So that's usually quite a common path for people, but quantum computers don't behave in any way like Python. So actually, if you're starting to think about, if you want to think about how do I actually program a quantum computer, the quantum computers we have today are very primitive. So I talked about kind of hundreds or thousands of qubits, but my laptop has many billions of bits in it. So my laptop has space for the overhead of Python, for all of the runtime stuff that Python does in the interpreter and so on, for all of the memory management, all of the different things that are going on behind the scenes. Quantum computers have none of that. So quantum languages are pretty straightforward, but you need to understand how the quantum computer works. So understanding them is relatively straightforward, but the transition to understanding how do I construct a really efficient uh, piece of code, for example, like that really uses the bare minimum uh, within my computer. That's like, uh, you know, similar to assembly language, but I would say C. C is really uh, actually quite a good entry point in the sense that it's it's a high level programming language, but it's kind of as close to the metal as you get in those high level programming languages. You know what the computer is doing at every point in time. It's not doing anything magical for you. You have to build everything. Uh, and you care about where each byte of memory is. And that's, uh, you know, once you go to C++, you start to abstract some of this away and it becomes more complicated. But C itself, I, I would say, that's going to be useful going going forward, at least in terms of the mindset of how to get the most out of the hardware when resources are really a priority. Awesome, thank you. I'll tell him I think he might do plus, but C or maybe C plus plus. But anyway, thank you. Great answer. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is this has been a fascinating uh, conversation, Joe. Really appreciate you joining us. And um, you know, I think I think what you guys are doing at Horizon, I'm I'm excited to keep watching you guys, and I think everyone should kind of keep watching what they're doing, making this this idea of algor uh, quantum algorithms a little bit more accessible, right? As we try to figure out what that what that next meaningful use is or what that first meaningful use is as we move forward that will scale and scale double exponential people. That's massive, right? Well, but don't, don't you think that Joe had a, a really clear way of explaining things, especially early in the conversation when he was explaining with analogy some complex ideas? Maybe it's because we've been reading the book on Connor, but it, it was very well delivered and made sense yeah and uh keep us posted on what 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 you guys are up to we'll be sharing some show notes and and all that fun stuff if you got questions for joe hit us up uh i believe it's hello at thinking on paper.xyz you can also check us out on uh, all the old episodes there on spotify youtube all of that fun stuff uh i had fun mark you i had good? fun i always have fun yeah that was brilliant highlight of my week beautiful thanks joe hey guys be curious stay disruptive keep thinking on paper Till next Bye -bye. time.